Project cost management. Those are words that sometimes strike fear into the heart of a project manager because they have that kind of air of mathematical magic and mystery. But actually, it's quite straightforward. But it's also a vital discipline because there is almost certainly nothing your project sponsor, your boss, or your client, or certainly their finance director will care more about than your budget, how you spend it, and how you keep it under control. So in this video, I want to look at how you can deliver effective project cost management. Mentally, I divide project cost management into two disciplines. On the one hand, we've got estimating and budgeting. And on the other hand, we've got monitoring and controlling that budget. The PMI's Project Management Body of Knowledge defines project cost management as one of its 10 essential knowledge areas, and it splits it into four basic processes. The first is to plan your cost management, which is effectively the wraparound, the framework for everything we're going to talk about today. The second is estimating costs. And the third is planning your budget. Those two things I'm going to pull together into one discussion. And the fourth process is controlling costs, which takes into account the monitor, the control, the reporting, and dealing with exceptional issues like cost overruns and requests for change. So the first thing to think about is your project cost management plan. This is the overarching framework within which you're going to manage costs on your project. It's one of two essential financial management documents on anything but the smallest projects. The other one, of course, being your business case. We've got a video about that if you need to learn about business case. Your cost management plan is an important document because it gives your client, your sponsor, your boss, a strong indication of your ability to understand how much money you're going to spend, how you're going to control that expenditure, and how you're going to account for it once you've spent it. For smaller projects, your project cost management plan may be just an element in a wider project plan, but clearly, as your project gets bigger, you may want to separate this out into its own document. And of course, the two principal elements of your cost management plan are on the one hand, budgeting and estimating, and on the other hand, monitoring and controlling. The first sets out how you're going to create a budget, the process you're going to use for estimating the elements of the budget that you're going to have. And the second is the monitor and control process, the mechanisms you're going to use to track expenditure on your project and keep everything under control. So this document is fundamentally an important part of your project governance. There may be other components that you need to bring in because of the nature of the guidelines, the policies, the procedures within your organization or set out by your PMO, your project program or portfolio management office. So the first thing you need to think about is establishing the costs for your project. And this is about estimating and budgeting. And I know that the PMI separate these into two processes within their PMBOK guide. I think of them as highly integrated. But it's important to note that estimating is one of the hardest disciplines for project managers. I've written a guide about how to estimate on a project and I'm not going to talk about that in any great detail here. However, I am going to talk about the essentials of what needs to go into a project budget. Uh, but before we do that, let's answer the question, why do we need a budget for our project at all? Why do we need to estimate our costs and put them into a formal document? Well, firstly, you'll use your budget as the basis for creating your investment appraisal and to your business case, the document that will justify 
whether or not your project is viable. Secondly, it's important in calculating the funding requirement, how much money your project needs to secure either internally or potentially borrowed from the lending markets. And of course, therefore, it's essential to have a proper budget if you're to win approval from within your organization. Moving forward, your budget is also going to be important in framing negotiations with suppliers, either for goods or for services. And once you've got those contracts in place, your budget is part of the process of controlling the costs from those contractors. And let's not forget the importance of reporting, actually giving your sponsor, your boss, client good information about how things are proceeding. And the final thing I'd mention is the importance of having a good budget in establishing the success criteria for your project, how you will measure either success or failure of your project. One of those elements is the extent to which you hit your budget and stay within your contingency, or indeed the extent to which you don't need your contingency at all. The best way to do estimating on a project is task by task. So we typically build our budget using a tool like a spreadsheet, and we start from a work breakdown structure, a list of all the tasks that need to get done, or if you're based in the US, a list of the products that need to get created. Once you've got your work breakdown structure, you can do your estimates line by line. And there are also different types of budget item. And so your spreadsheet could be in the form of a table. Each task could have different budget headings assigned to it, different types of expenditure. Typical categories of expenditure include the following. First, there's time. Contractor or consultant time is usually charged either by the hour or by the day. Secondly, there's the time of your own people, the people within your organization who are working on the project. Now, not every organization accounts for the time of its staff on a project. But my advice is that it is always good practice to do so, even if you don't need to make contributions for their time through the internal systems. So I would budget for that, but have that as a very separate budget heading so that if your organization doesn't need to account for it, you don't include it in the business case. But tracking people's time gives you an indication of how effective you are in managing your project. Next, of course, we've got the costs of materials, supplies, products that go into making your project work. And then, of course, and we've got the costs of acquiring and using assets, often lease costs or higher costs, or maybe internal recharges. There may be other direct costs to your project, such as travel or printing or marketing of some sort. You may need to purchase some equipment too. And finally, there are taxes and foreign exchange costs, which may not be recoverable. So for those, you need to speak with your finance team to understand what you need to include. There are other costs as well. These are indirect costs which cannot be attributed solely to your project, but the organization may want your project to account for a portion of those indirect costs to give a sense of how much the project is really costing the organization. And some organizations treat the time cost of their own employees in that way. However, more typical examples include things like premises costs, software licenses, office equipment, telecoms charges, insurance and banking costs, things like foreign exchange and interest rates. And finally, there may be some form of general administrative overhead for using the facilities within the organization. When you're building your budget, it's also important to take account of uncertainties, things you don't know. Examples include fluctuations in the cost of raw materials, foreign exchange rates, foreign exchange rates and interest rates, inflation, external risks like weather and events. And finally, 
uncertainties in time and materials contracts with consultants and contractors. Fixed fee contract is highly predictable. But if you take on consultants or contractors on a time and materials basis, then they will charge you for the time they use. And whilst they may give you estimates, you won't know exactly how much you're going to be spending on them until you receive their invoice. It does make sense to put in control mechanisms in the contract, but that's a topic for another video. We handle all this by putting contingency into our budget possibly contingency under a number of different headings. And by the way, the PMBOK guide refers to contingency in this sense as reserves. Governance is clearly an important part of project cost management. Certainly you need some mechanism on a large project for financial review. And whilst the PMI's project management body of knowledge is lamentably light, certainly in its sixth edition on project governance, we can look to Axelos's PRINCE2 methodology for the best guidance in governing a project wisely. And one of the things that PRINCE2 recommends is that for large projects that are spending large amounts of money or subject to high levels of public scrutiny or oversight, is that the project has what it calls a senior financial officer, which mirrors the role of the senior responsible officer on the project. Now, in Pred's terms, that's very similar to what most of us think of as a project sponsor. The senior financial officer has a level of responsibility for the project, but targeted solely on its financial accountability. Now, it's not the responsibility of the SFO to carry out project cost management, but it is their responsibility to oversee that process and to take checks and to work with the project manager to make sure that she or he is doing that aspect of their job well and properly. Another thing that PRINCE2 is very strong on that appears in many project management methodologies is the idea of project gateways or stage gates. And the idea of using those checkpoints on your project to validate the level of cost control, to observe the extent to which the project is running on or over or behind budget, and then to make appropriate recommendations at that point. When we talk about monitoring and controlling, what we're doing is separating out the initial process of observing how much is being spent against budget and the controlling process of taking corrective steps if expenditure is not where it should be. If I'm honest, for most small projects, a good, well-constructed spreadsheet is the best tool to use for monitoring and controlling our projects and it can also have use as a reporting tool. However, spreadsheets are dangerous as your projects get bigger and more complex. Many spreadsheets have small errors in them. You need a more carefully validated tool. And also, a spreadsheet that you understand because you built it may not be understandable to me if I need to take over your project for whatever reason. So as your project gets bigger, you need some dedicated tool. There are some standalone project cost management tools built especially for the project environment. Likewise, many financial management tools used in large organizations have project capability, the ability to set up a project, to load up the work breakdown structure, to allocate costs against each item, and therefore to use that internal financial management tool as your project cost management tool. But many project managers will prefer a dedicated project management tool that acts as a project management information system, but also integrates with all of the other planning capabilities. I'm not the right person to advise you on the best project management tools and software to use. But what I can say is there are a number of things a good project management information system needs to be able to do 
if it's going to support you properly in good project cost management. It needs to be able to gather, to record, and to store safely all of your project cost information, both the budget and the outturn. It needs to be able to collate that information and allocate it into budget headings in the ways that will suit you in understanding your project. And it needs to give you the tools you need to analyze your expenditure and your costs to really understand what's going on. And finally, a good project management information system needs to be able to present the information clearly so that you can use it both for reporting and for face to face presentations. Another tool, which is frankly outside the scope of this video, is earned value management, or sometimes referred to as earned value analysis. And again, we have a video on that, but it is important for you to understand the potential of earned value management to support you in good project cost management. Whatever tools you use, whether it's earned value management or tools embedded in your project management information system, you need to be able to create trends of expenditure to analyze those trends and to produce forecasts. And based on those forecasts, you need to be able to select appropriate actions and make recommendations to the governance structures within and around your project. If things go wrong, you need to be prepared to make changes to your budget, to your plan, to your baseline, and to put those changes through a rigorous process of change control. You also need a mechanism to reflect what's happening and your risk register and your issue log, and a mechanism to draw down on contingencies if you have them. And finally, if things do start to go wrong, you need to incorporate what's happening into your review of lessons learned so that they don't continue to go wrong in the future. The final thing to mention is the need to tailor your project cost management approach to the nature of your project and to the culture of the organization within which it works. Clearly, the most significant tailoring decisions are based on firstly, the scale and complexity of your project. The bigger your project is, the more robust your project cost management probably needs to be. And secondly, the nature of the project management approach that you're taking. Crudely, on the one hand, you may be taking a highly planned predictive approach. And on the other hand, you may be taking a highly adaptive agile approach. And clearly your project cost management approach needs to be tailored to that. Project cost management is one of the most important skills that a project manager can have. Project cost overruns are common. But is this cause for a defeatist attitude? No. Instead, you must act with determination to understand project cost management and to apply a rigorous process to your project. Cost management is a popular topic, but not because people enjoy it though. It's mostly because people don't know how to do it. And it's not part of many project management training courses. But for all that, cost management is very important. My history with project cost management is pretty unusual. My father was a shopkeeper and he was very cautious, particularly with money. And a lot of that has rubbed off on me. As a result, I find speaking about and writing about project cost management difficult because it all seems so obvious, but not easy. And I know there are a lot of sophisticated tools, but I confess I do it almost by instinct. No one taught me project cost management. I figured it out for myself. As a practicing project manager in the 1990s and the early 2000s, I had a pretty poor tool set to work with, despite working for one of the biggest accountancy based project management consulting firms in the world. We had at the time a pretty poor management information system, which gave delayed 
and poor project financial information. I'm sure they've changed the system now, but the truth is I have never worked with a full project management information system and certainly not one that can do cost control. In fact, when I was managing large projects, I did all of the financial management using spreadsheets. And these were spreadsheets I created myself. I did eventually come to learn the basics. I had to learn how to create big spreadsheets and I also had to learn the conventions. How do you manage multi million dollar projects? What's the meaning of cash flows and profitability? And how do you represent them properly on spreadsheets? I had to acquire a deep understanding for the numbers and what they meant in order to satisfy not just my clients, but my bosses who were looking over my shoulder to ensure that my projects were profitable. Therefore, it was time well spent. Nothing pushes cost management higher up your priority list than strict oversight, particularly from the people who can either promote you or demote you. And as a project manager, as far as my employer was concerned, I had only two core project management metrics, financial performance and client satisfaction. Getting good at project cost management was a matter of self-preservation. And even if you were not in exactly that situation, I bet that somewhere in your organization or your client's organization is a financial director or a finance manager who is going to be interested in your project financials. And if you don't have good answers for them, then you are in trouble. I'm working on a new video on project cost management, but in the meantime, we have a great article on the website, which I'll link to in the description below. Project finances aren't anybody's favorite topic unless you're a finance director. And estimating is one of the greatest challenges anybody faces in a project environment because we are assailed by biases and in an environment of uncertainty. But we're going to tackle it anyway, because in this video, I'm going to look at how to estimate project costs. Before I start looking at how to make our estimates, I want to highlight one of the real problems we face as project managers and leaders. And that's what I call the estimating knife edge. The knife edge separates the two competing pressures we have to deal with whenever we're making estimates of cost or indeed of time. On the one side of the knife edge is the pressure, the pull even, from our clients from our bosses, from our sponsors and from our stakeholders to minimize costs or indeed to minimize the duration of a project to get it done as quickly and as cheaply as we possibly can. On the other side of the knife edge is the pull in the opposite direction to include as much cost, as much contingency, as much time as we possibly can to reduce the risk of cost or schedule overruns, to give us as project managers the best possible chance of delivering what we've promised, when we've promised it, and to the budget that we committed. And you are always going to be walking along that knife edge, trying to balance those two competing pulls. The process of project cost estimation needs to start with understanding the scope of the work you need to do. And the tool for that is a work breakdown structure. Once you have your work breakdown structure, you can estimate the time it will take to deliver each component of work. And from that, you can allocate people into the roles to do the work. And when you combine the time it will take with the cost of each of those resources, that starts to build up a cost estimate for the work that it will take. But there are other resources as well. And for each piece of work, 
you can also overlay the materials and the equipment and the assets that you need to do that piece of work and to put in place cost estimates from those. The fundamental tool for building a cost estimate is a work breakdown structure which you convert into a cost breakdown structure. So what are likely to be the sources of cost that we need to build into our estimates? Well, for many projects, the single largest cost is people. And these are your staff, your contractors and your consultants. Each will come with a different methodology for calculating it. And bear in mind that some organizations do not account for the cost of their own staff, seeing them as a completely sunk cost. As a project manager, even if my client organization doesn't wish to account for the cost of its staff, I always like to calculate it to give a true picture of how much the project is costing them. Next are real estate assets, property, facilities, offices, warehousing. All of these costs are large. And there are other assets besides property. And in estimating these, you may need to treat them as capital costs, or you may be able to treat them as revenue costs if you're going to lease or hire them in some way. Then we've got non-capital costs, revenue costs, things like materials and components. We've also got licenses because a large part of many projects now involves software which needs to be licensed whether it's the project management software tools or software that is part of the thing you're creating as a project. And finally, there are the financing costs, things like interest, foreign exchange and insurances. So what are some of the techniques that you can use to estimate? I'm going to offer you six basic estimating methods. And the first is an order of magnitude estimate. The idea of starting at the top and thinking about the big chunks and the approximate amounts that each of those are going to cost to produce a figure that is very round. If your project is going to be in the millions, then each of these sections may only be estimated to hundreds of thousands. If your project is going to be in the tens of thousands, then each of these components may be estimated to the nearest thousand. Order of magnitude costs will give you a sense of how big your project is and therefore some of the key elements of how much detail you're going to need to satisfy your client, your boss, your sponsor. The next method is to look at past projects and similar examples, technically known as reference class forecasting you're forecasting or estimating the costs based on known examples that are comparable. But even when you do find comparable examples from the past, look at where there will be systematic variations between the past example and your present example. And of course, the most obvious one is cost inflation. If something cost $100,000 10 years ago, there's a good chance it's going to cost $150,000 today. The next method is called parametric forecasting, what I like to call rule of thumb forecasting. If we know that one worker can lay 100 bricks an hour, then if we know we need to lay 200,000 bricks, we can work out how many hours of work. And if we know we're going to fit it within a certain amount of time, that tells us how many people we're going to need. And if we know the daily rate of an average bricklayer, We've got all the data we need to make the calculation of the time cost. So parametric forecasting takes key numbers and multiplies them and adds them in a logical mathematical way. The next method is to ask for bids or tenders to find out how much people are prepared to do the work for and to use that as the basis of your estimate. Now, one would think that if you get a firm tender, that that will give you the firm cost, but not all bids are based on fixed cost. And so you're going to need to build in some assumptions. And of course, there may be contract variations along the way. So you'll need to pack contingency 
into any estimates, even if you've got a fixed price bid. The next is catalogues and pricing tables. These are great working with your parametric forecasting methods. If you can draw down comparable data from published catalogues, from published pricing tables, you've got a great resource for building up your estimates. And finally, a great way to get really good data is to build a sample or a test or a pilot or a prototype. You can calculate the actual cost of doing that and use that as an input into your estimate for the bigger full production version. And of course, the secret to good estimating is to combine as many of these techniques as you can. And if you build an estimate, but it really matters how robust that estimate is, what about using a red team to either tear your estimate apart and look for faults, or better yet, to build their own parallel estimate and compare the two done in different ways by different minds with different approaches. You'll learn a lot by finding out why one team has done it one way and another has done it another way. And the first team got answer A, the second team got answer B. By comparing the two and understanding those differences, you'll be able to generate a better estimate. Always, always, always add contingency to your estimates. And my guidance is always not just to add one single contingency figure, but to look at the different work streams or the different functional components of your project or the different phases, and to look at the different levels of uncertainty associated with each of those based on their characteristics and what's in them. And therefore, you may add 10% contingency to one work stream because it's fairly familiar, fairly well understood technology, but another work stream may be use not using off the shelf components, maybe doing something we've not done before. And you may choose to put something like 40% contingency into that work stream. And when you combine all of those contingencies, then you'll get a robust project contingency. Finally, when you've got your estimates and you've got your contingency, it's time to build them into a cash flow. That way you can see how expenditure will flow out of your project and hopefully revenue into your project if appropriate over time. And if it's a long project and therefore the cost of interest and the effects of inflation are going to be significant, that needs to be what's called a discounted cash flow that takes into account those changes. And we have a video answering the question, what is a discounted cash flow that you can watch? And of course, once you've got your cash flow and your budget, you've got the basis for building your business case. Because your business case is nothing more than a comparison between all of the costs that you just estimated and all of the benefits, which is a whole separate exercise. Take a look at our videos on business case for more information. So cost estimating, it's uncertain, it is difficult, but there are tools and techniques to help you. Understand the different elements that go into your estimate and the different approaches you can take, and you will be able to produce a reliable estimate for your project. In this video, I'm going to answer the question, what is sunk cost? And I'll also look at the sunk cost trap or sunk cost fallacy. Sunk cost is an investment of money, time or resources that you've already made and can no longer recover. In the sense that you can no longer recover them, the costs are sunk. We can compare sunk cost with future cost. Future costs can change. Therefore, our decisions can influence future costs. Sunk costs can't change and our decisions cannot influence them. And therefore, they should form no part in our decision making. The sunk cost trap or sunk cost fallacy is the mistake we make when we try to incorporate consideration of sunk costs in the decision that we're about to make. 
when we use arguments about investments that we've already made to help to justify decisions about investments we might make in the future, then it's a fallacy. Let's take a look at an example. Let's take the example of a prototype product. Let's say we've already invested a million dollars in building this prototype and it very nearly works. In fact, it will cost only $50 to buy the one component you need to get it working. But we've learned something. We've just learned that one of our competitors has just brought to market a far superior product. And not only that, they are selling it at a price lower than we intended to pitch our product. More than that, our competitor's product uses a more advanced technology which will make it far easier for them to develop their product in the future. And now, other competitors are entering the market advertising future products which will raise the bar even higher. Our prototype is already out of date and our marketing and sales teams are telling us that they will not be able to recoup even the cost of the marketing and promotion in sales. Our product will never be able even to break even. But we've already invested a million dollars and it will only cost $50 to finish the project. So should we do it? If you think that having spent a million dollars, we pretty much ought to finish the project, then you have fallen for the sunk cost trap. The fact is that in making the decision about spending the $50, only one thing matters. If we spend this $50, will we get at least $50 worth of value from our additional investment? The $1 million, that is sunk cost, it is written off. Whatever we do, we will not get it back. So all that matters is the future cost, the $50. And if we spend $50 to complete the product and we cannot recoup that $50, that $50 will be wasted. It is just throwing good money after bad. The right thing to do in this situation is to save that $50 for another project and to write off our $1 million investment. There may be some benefit we can recover from it. And if there is, then there is a new investment decision to be made as to how we can use that marginal benefit. But the sunk cost trap is where we continue to invest in something just because we've already put a lot of time and effort into it. And be under no illusions. What's really going on when people fall prey to the sunk cost trap is psychological. It's not the money they've invested. It's the time, the energy, the emotional commitment, the political capital that they put into supporting the project. They fear that by not completing the project, they will lose face. In your project decision making, you need to be careful not to fall prey to the sunk cost trap. If you do, you will waste money. If, on the other hand, you recognize that sunk cost is irrecoverable and you start from a blank sheet looking at each new investment on its own merits, you'll make better decisions and you'll get better projects. In this video, I want to answer the question, what is opportunity cost? There's an old saying, time is money. What it means is that if you try to save money by doing something yourself, then you may be wasting money because it will take you time to do the thing yourself that you could have spent doing other things. You need to think about the value of your time. And this is particularly salient to many internal organizational projects that do not account for the cost of their people's time. 
but I'm using the time is money example to illustrate opportunity cost. When you use your time to work on one thing, you lose the opportunity to spend that time working on something else. Equally, when you spend money on one thing, you lose the opportunity to spend the same money on something else. And if that something else is worth more to you, then that is the opportunity cost. Opportunity costs represent the benefits that an organization or an individual forego when they choose to spend their time or their money on one thing rather than on another. Of course, the core application for the idea of opportunity costs to project managers is in our business cases, our investment appraisals and our project proposals. And opportunity costs are not limited to financial monetary costs. Any cost that you forego is an opportunity cost, whether it's the cost in money terms, in resource terms, in usage of assets, or in deployment of people and their time. In fact, wherever there is a difference between the benefit in any shape or form, between two options, you create an opportunity cost. That benefit could be personal pleasure or competitive advantage or company morale. But we use the term explicit opportunity cost to refer to the use of money for one purpose when it could be used for an alternate purpose. And we use the term implicit opportunity cost when we're referring to the use of anything other than money, time, resources, energy, effort. So in the evaluation of investment appraisals, business cases and project proposals, project decision makers, members of the project board, your client, your project sponsor need to use the idea of opportunity cost to properly evaluate proposal or business case in front of them. Understanding the potential missed opportunities that they will forego by following through on one particular project proposal will allow them to make a better informed decision. And better informed decisions lead to better projects. And the opportunity cost calculation is very straightforward. The opportunity cost is simply the return on the option that you have foregone minus the return on the option that you have chosen. And it doesn't matter how you calculate that return as long as you do it on the same basis for both options. It therefore stands that the option that has the greatest negative opportunity cost the opportunity benefit is the option that you should prefer on the basis of this calculation. Other factors may, of course, apply. The concept of opportunity cost helps us to properly evaluate our choices between several alternative options. And of course, one option is always to do nothing. If, as a project manager, you properly understand opportunity cost and you document it in your project proposals, in your business cases and your investment appraisals, then you are giving your decision makers the best chance of making the right decision. The time cost quality triangle or the time cost scope triangle or even the four way constraint are key concepts in project management. And once you understand those concepts, you can assess many problems in project management. But they also create a trap that many businesses fall into and government departments and not for profits too. Project managers understand the trade offs between time, cost, quality, and scope. And we also become adept 
at understanding and interpreting the priorities of our sponsors, our clients, our users, and all of our stakeholders. But still, we often find ourselves falling into a trap at one corner. And this is the corner labeled cost. And the trap is particularly prevalent in projects that have large procurement needs, are securing large amounts of goods and services from the market. We find ourselves hooked on trying to keep the costs down. As a result, we find ourselves negotiating hard with our suppliers, trying to drive a hard bargain, trying to drive their margins down so that we can keep more of the benefits for our project, for our sponsoring organization. And in principle, there's nothing wrong with that. But there is a price to pay for this strategy. A supplier squeezed with tight margins will, at the very least, be somewhat reticent about the amount of collaboration they offer. They will be trying to recover as much of those margins as they possibly can by shaving costs wherever they can. And of course, if you need to make changes and issue contract variations, then it's very likely that that supplier will be relentless in trying to recover as much cost from that as they possibly can. And that hit your bottom line. And once you're locked into that supplier's products, services or technology, well, their ongoing services, renewals and upgrades are going to be very costly. Cheap is dear, said my father. At worst, the low margins that you negotiate might place them in a precarious commercial position, meaning that if they suffer adverse consequences outside of your project, it may affect their ability to deliver your project and therefore hit you really hard. And yes, I have seen that happen. And of course, that knowledge can drive disruptive behavior on the part of that supplier, as well as affecting their own viability. They may actually prefer to accept your penalties rather than incurring the large losses that they feel they've negotiated. And sometimes contractors fail, leaving a whole mess of liquidation issues. The answer isn't to scrap cost altogether and ignore the priority of minimizing cost on your project. The answer is to stop thinking of that corner of the triangle as being about cost alone. Better still, relabel it value and interpret value far more widely than just being about cost. Look at as many other factors as you can in determining which contractor, which supplier, which provider offers you the greatest value for money. The same, by the way, goes for everything, even your household purchases. A question I answered in a recent video was, should project managers get involved in large scale project procurement or should we just leave it to the professional procurement team? And my answer to that was simple. Absolutely, yes, we should get involved in the procurement. If we leave project procurement entirely to the professional procurement team, there is a good chance that they will make their decisions based solely on two things. One is detailed procurement rules within the organization. And secondly, is cost. We know that there are other things that are more important than both of those. It's the needs of the project that matter. And that means balancing time, scope, quality and risk against value. If you've enjoyed this video, please do smash the like button. I'll be making loads more great project management content for you. So please do subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss any of it. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video.